Hello everyone, my name is Olivier. I'm French, I'm a local. I was, I mean, local from Caen. I was born here in uh, Caen, Normandy, France. Welcome to the Memorial Museum in Caen. You may know the city of Caen, C-A-E-N, by the way, that's the uh, correct pronunciation of the city. We have nothing to do with Cannes, South Wales, no Pan Twist here, no Team Festival. Uh, this museum is known for, uh, for the Second World War. By the way, we're not only a Second World War museum, a museum dedicated to the Second World War. I will have a few words uh, about this later on. One of the very first things I would like to uh, talk about is, um, is the uh, flags right above my, uh, my head. Is that working or not? We can hear you nice and clearly, Olivier. Please continue. About, okay. Um, so the uh, uh, flags right above my head are the flags of the nation that we are all involved into the Battle of Namendi. It seems like there is one more, actually more than uh, two or three nations, the most well-known nations like uh, Canada, Great Britain, like the US as well. Uh, there were actually 15 different nations uh, that were involved uh, on that day. When I'm saying on that day, I mean on June 6, 1944. 156,000 men took part in the landing that day. This is why so many different nations took part into the uh, D-Day landings. Uh, so one of the very first things I'd like to start with is to thank those nations. Uh, as you may be able to see, there are actually some flags like Poland, like Greece, like Finland, uh, that also took part to the Battle of Namendi. This one over there, the very first one, the, the, the one nearest to the museum is the flag of Germany. That's because we just simply don't want to make, we, we don't want to make any differences between the, the defeated nations and the victorious nations. This is a museum for peace, by the way, so I will have plenty of time to tell you what this museum is about. We don't want to, uh, to emphasize on the nasty things and the misdeeds the Germans did during the war. We don't even want to point out the great things that the US and the British did during the war. This is a museum of, uh, for peace. So I'll have a few words with you uh, later on during my presentation. Um, let me tell you that this museum is actually not only a World War II museum, this is, uh, by the way, the main structure of the building, uh, which is dedicated to the uh, entire war, to the entire Second World War, starting in 1939 and up in uh, 1945. If you uh, just follow me, Laura, uh, the filmmaker, this is uh, two different buildings, two different buildings. It looks like they're different in shape. The one way over there is actually the one of the Cold War period because we also covered the 1945-1989 uh, period. And the one in the middle, it looks like also circular in shape. The one uh, that is actually dark is actually a theater. It's a, a third building. It's actually a theater where a movie is shown every 30 minutes. The same movie is shown, a movie about, the, uh, about Europe, about how Europe has changed over the 100 last years. Now, I think I'm all set. I think you're all set. I hope you're all set. So we're going to now enter the museum and make the, uh, the shortest visit ever, shortest visit ever, because to be honest with you, I've been doing this job for years and years, and it always takes me something like uh, at least two hours to have a, a, pre a brief presentation of the uh, World War II section. Uh, but if you're an individual, if I see like an uh, individual traveler and, to make, and you want to make the visit of this museum by yourself, I just want to tell you that it, would, it can take you something like five, six, seven hours to make the whole visit of the museum because what I'm considering is that you actually need two or three hours to make this visit of this World War II section. You will also need the same amount of time, like two, three hours as well to, the, to do the uh, Cold War Museum. And something important as well, important about the location, why this museum was built here, that's because we're just overlooking the, uh, the German HQ, the uh, German headquarters. I have a few more words about the German General Richter, who was actually uh, there on June 6, 1944. He was from there commanding the, uh, the German troops that were actually stationed on the, uh, along the, the Norman coastline. Something interesting as well, we're located in Caen, remember, we should be less than 10 miles away from the nearest landing beach. And that's where uh, the, uh, the 766th, 716th, I'm sorry, Infantry Division 716 was actually located at that time. So let's get inside the museum, inside the main hall. I will soon make a left so that you can have a quick look at the man, at the gentleman who was behind the uh, construction of this museum. This is the gentleman, his name was Jean-Marie Zero. It's the uh, brainchild, let's say the Jean-Marie Zero's ID. 
to build the museum. He was a young man at the time. He was actually 13 years old when the war broke out. Uh, he was 18. He just turned 18 actually on June 6, 1944, when the Olympic took place on the Normandy beaches. And what he decided to do is very, uh, is very clever. Disregarding his own safety, this gentleman decided to join the uh, Saint Etienne Church, one of the many different churches in downtown. And he actually did the best he could to uh, treat the wounded man. This is where the church was actually turned into. Uh, I'm sorry about that. The Saint Etienne Church was actually one of the churches in town which had been turned into a net post, into a uh, let's say, let's say like a hospital field, into a net post. And every day he was again disregarding his own safety. He was trying to to do the best he could. Although he was neither a surgeon, he was not a doctor. He was he was just a, a simple student of. Uh, he was just studying law at the time. But he did, again, the best he could to save the, the life of the civilian. That gentleman turned to be the new mayor of the city of Caen. He actually remained the mayor of the city of Caen for more than 30 years, 1970 to 2001. And in the early 80s, he was the gentleman who decided that we should do something. We should, do, we should actually build something, build a place, a museum, a memorial rather than a museum, I should say, in order to, uh, to pay a tribute to all men who gave their life to our freedom, to all men and civilians as well women and women who lost their life during the, the terrible Battle of Normandy, the three months long Battle of Normandy. Uh, one of the very last uh, things he said just before he passed away, because he sadly passed away uh, three years ago, was that peace should never be taken for granted. And this is, in my mind, one of the uh, things we should keep in our mind. It's weird to think about this, but we almost have to fight to gain peace every day. Now we're still in the main hall of the museum. I will uh, ask Laura, uh, your filmmaker today, to zoom in on the uh, on this aircraft, which is a British aircraft, which is actually an English aircraft. This is what we call an English Typhoon. English, actually, this is a, just a scale model of a British Typhoon. Uh, this one is actually the, the same copy, the replica of a Typhoon that was shot down over Caen, just a few hundred yards away from the city of Caen on the, uh, on the night of the 6th to the 7th of June, so the very next day after the day. The particularity of those typhoons is that, as you can see, there was actually only one uh, pilot inside the cockpit. Thank you, Laura. And the goal of the pilot was actually to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get rid of the, of the German tanks downtown. Uh, as you might be also able to see that there were actually one, two, three, four uh, rockets on each wing. So the goal, of, the goal of the pilots was, needless to say, to uh, destroy the German tanks, which is something unusual to be honest with you, because most of the time, the goal of the pilots were to fight in the air and not to uh, destroy the German tanks in the ground. That's also, and perhaps because the supremacy of the, uh, of the ground in the early days of the Normandy campaign was clearly German. What I mean by that is, is that, I mean, from D-Day on, starting on D-Day, Germans really had the, the supremacy of the ground. The German tanks were uh, clearly much, let's say, they were the, the, the best tanks ever. It looks like uh, the British tanks could not, could not match. British and English, I should say, were fighting inside uh, some of their tanks, like the British tanks, like the Churchill tanks. The Germans were actually laughing at the, at, the, at the British. They used to call the, the British tanks the Ronson tanks. Ronson was the name of a glowing product, you know. So they, uh, they used to call that tank, the, the, the Brit British tank Ronson, because once hit, the British tanks would go in planes very, very quickly. On the other hand, the, um, the, the German tanks were sometimes hit twice at the same spot. They were still able to carry on the fight because the armor was much thicker. German tanks were, in, uh, in any case, very much more heavier than the, than the British tank, but the range of their guns was much more longer. They were then, therefore, much more powerful, and, and, the, and the armor protection was also much more thicker. So this is also uh, a reminder for any visitor as he walks in. That's more or less the very first thing that you can see. We, again, we don't want to... To scare you, we don't want to, to scare you, but we just want to remind you how brutal was the, uh, was the daily life uh, uh, for, the, for, for the civil society in Normandy. Now we're gonna hit this way and have a quick look about the different artifacts, even though, again, we are not uh, a museum whose objective is to uh, to, uh, to, to show, to, to, feature, to feature some uh, different artifacts, but I just want to walk by those different elements. This is one of the uh, uh, Fiat or Sinca that the German had used during the war. 
uh, a red cross was just painted on, but the Germans just uh, took that car. Elon Hitler was actually in love, you know, the, the Nazi leader, he was actually in love with that car and did ask Ferdinand Porsche to uh, build the exact same, not the exact same, but to, to, to build a, the same kind of, uh, uh, of car. And this is how Volkswagen was born later on, according to the uh, historians. Now we have the uh, one of the famous uh, flag gun. Flag gun is for the anti-aircraft machine gun. This one was uh, for the connoisseur, for the for the history bus, a 50 millimeter gun. The man who was operating that gun was a Mr. German. Every single time he managed to hit one of the uh, one of the uh, airplane, he was just painting. I guess Laura will notice that your filmmaker. I can tell you that the, the German who was operating operating this gun must have uh, destroyed seven different uh, aircraft, English aircraft. This is corresponding to the seven stripes. Seven, 76 years have passed, of course, but I guess you still can see those, those aircraft. Those, those, those are red, the white stripes, I'm sorry. Right there is, um, right here, Laura. This is uh, one of the uh, anti-tank gun that the German had used to uh, destroy the different tanks, English or um, US uh, tanks. Few words as well about this, uh, how can I say, this bridge, uh, which was actually inspired, which, which was actually realized by uh, Donald Bailey, an English citizen whose idea was to, to, to build this, this kind of, um, of, um, of bridge. The, idea was actually to, to, to do something quick and fast. You may know that many bridges in Amelie had to be destroyed. The reason was to mainly to slow down the German reinforcement in Amelie. So in order to slow down the German reinforcement, most of the bridges in Amelie all over the country were actually destroyed. What is interesting is that if they did so, if they did bomb the different bridges in Amelie, this also um, slowed down their, their own uh, uh, progression in land. So this is clearly the reason why uh, Donald Bailey devised this new type of, uh, of bridge. 50 uh, men, less than 50 men were necessary uh, to rebuild in less than four hours. Uh, those uh, kit was like a kit, like a mechanical set in less than four hours with 50 men. Uh, English and Americans were allowed, were able to uh, cross the different, uh, the different rivers in Normandy, Normandy and all over the country. Uh, this is one of what we call uh, a stone marker, which, had, uh, which actually starts on Utah Beach, one of the five landing beaches on D-Day. Uh, if you guys are great fan of George Patton, the, the crazy Patton, he was nicknamed Blood and Guts, you can actually follow into the footsteps of um, George Patton. It will take you uh, all the way through Normandy, Brittany, and uh, all the way to, um, to Belgium and the Battle of the Bulge, for instance. Now, this is Almost done. We are going. To, we are going to start our visit about the Battle of Normandy, the landing on the end of the Battle of Normandy. First, what I would like to do is that this is where the visit is supposed to start. This is where you you will start your visit if your idea is to come and and pay your tribute, come and visit this museum. The only thing you have to do is, uh, if of course you purchase your ticket through internet on ticket.com, you will just have to download the. Uh, uh, your app and download, actually scan your tickets uh, on the black machine like, just, like these people just did. Looks like these people purchased the ticket at their counters, but you can do better than that. You can actually save your time and book directly through tickets.com. So what is very important is that these people all start here. 1918, I hope you can see. Thank you, Laura. 1918, this is how it starts the visit. What we want to do here is we want to make you understand, to help you understand the different stages of the evolution of the world. So, if you start the visit here, you will actually walk by, uh, step by, I should say, or walk by, pass by the different key dates, the different uh, uh, events of the last century that obviously led to 1944. will take you uh, into, uh, to, 1940, to 1940. This, uh, this is again the ground floor. Right below the ground floor is the most important part of the museum that is dedicated to the, uh, to the destruction of the Jews, the Jewish race. 
needless to say, you all know what, uh, how much they suffered, but this is one of the most important tributes we cover. Uh, the entire uh, um, exhibition space right below this, this, this place is actually dedicated to the, uh, the, the Jewish race. Now, I guess this is the time to start the visit of the um, Second War. The second one, the landing on D-Day and the Battle of Namendi. So if Laura, it's in French, but I guess you all can figure out what it means. Oh, it looks like it doesn't work. There we go. So this is uh, the uh, room we're gonna get in in a few minutes. Uh, that is dedicated again to D-Day, the D-Day landings and the Battle of Normandy. You all know D-Day, you all know the date of D-Day, June 6, 1944. What you may not know is the, the exact day of the week. Uh, as you can see, it's clearly signed, which is Mardi in French, which is Tuesday, June the 6, 1944. Five beaches, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. So let's enter and walk inside the, uh, this room. Actually, Utah, Omaha, Gold, you know, and so on. You must be wondering why and how all those names, this is one of the questions that I have often been asked, how those names were born, how did they choose the name of the uh, different beaches? Uh, what you got to expect is not something uh, scientific, it's something or, or something extra extraordinary. Mission fell to Montgomery, you may know that Ike Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander uh, was you know, the, the, the head chief. So he decided, he did ask uh, both Omar Bradley, who was in charge of the US Army, and uh, Montgomery, who was in charge of the English Canadian forces. The question was, you guys need to find out uh, five names for the, for, for the five beaches. So the very first uh, Montgomery's idea was actually to name the three beaches, goldfish, jellyfish, and saltfish. Drop, just drop the fish. Looks like the Canadians were not happy with their with their Jelly Beach. So the Canadian leader uh, who was in charge just came out of, his name just came out of my mind, but he was not very happy with that. His men were not very happy with that either. So he just turned uh, Jelly into Juno, who was actually, which was actually the first name of his uh, wife-to-be at the time. This is how the three uh, English Canadian beaches names uh, were born. As for the Americans, mission again fell to Omar Bradley. Looks like Omar Bradley didn't really, didn't really care about that. So the question was asked actually to his two young assistants. One was coming from uh, Nebraska and Omaha in particular. That's for the, uh, one of the two American beaches. And the other one was coming actually from Salt Lake City uh, in Utah. This is how the five names, uh, were, the five code names, I should say, were born that day. Now, hopefully I won't be able to talk as loud as I'm doing now but there are a few people here. So this is where starts the, uh, the this is where we start my speech. This is first of all, a large photograph of the both men, which, which I consider like a, you might consider like a big bunch of uh, heroes. In, uh, in the right middle is the portrait of Ike, of course. Ike was, Eisenhower, I should say, was the Supreme Commander. And as you may see, he was flanked by Montgomery on his left, Montgomery, Bernard Montgomery. Uh, who was in charge of the English and Canadian forces. So again, I, Montgomery, and Omar Bradley, who was in charge on D-Day of the US troops. This is the Admiral Ramsey, who was in charge of the, of the Navy. And then Lane Mallory, who was in charge of the uh, Air Force US, both the US and the uh, English Air Force. These were really some uh, big heroes, big bunch of heroes, uh, you, something that you might not know is that uh, I, everybody know, in which he said that he was very happy because the landing was successful. You may know that uh, it took three months to liberate the uh, Namendi region. So this went according to the plan because Eisenhower said that uh, three months will be necessary to liberate Namendi. Um, 
for a change, let's say that he wasn't tied. I say for a change because uh, he also was considering that one day will be enough to capture the city of Caen. It took actually one and a half months, almost uh, more than 50 days to liberate the city of Caen. That's why I'm saying for a change. But uh, this is one of the two letters he had written, fortunately, and I'm glad uh, that uh, one of the two letters he had written, letters in which he said, it truly breaks my heart, we did the best we could, but uh, uh, despite all what we did, despite all our information, we did not succeed in bending Normandy. This letter, letter uh, has never been known, and I'm glad that he had a famous letter in which he said that the, uh, the landing was successful. So let's talk about the landing itself and the five different beaches I was mentioning earlier, Omaha, Utah, Gold Beach, Salt Beach, and Juneau. Uh, I voluntarily misread uh, Trent du Hague because this is not a beach, it's actually one of the, five, one of the uh, most uh, important spots, which was actually known for its cliff. Trent du Hague is actually just the French name of a cliff, 30 meters high, uh, in between Omaha and Utah, part of Omaha, but in between the two different beaches. The mission of those men were actually to uh, scale the cliff and take out the guns that were supposed to be on the top. Now, uh, five different beaches. It looks like if you uh, have a quick look to the scale, it looks like the Americans were supposed to land first at 6.30 on Omaha and on, on Utah. If you now look further, uh, further this way, gold, Juno, and so it looks like the were an hour to make, the, to, to make the, the own landing as well. So this might be one of the questions you must be, one of the uh, many different questions you, you might be wondering, is why, uh, why did the US land first and why did the Canadians and the British have to wait, uh, why did they wait that long, why did they wait an hour? This was actually in order to compensate for the differences in tight times along the coast. What I mean by the differences in tight times along the coast, I mean that on D-Day, one of the, um, one of the conditions was the landing at low tide. Low tide in order not to repeat the deep failure, the deep mistake. If we have some Canadians listening to us, you, I'm sure, know everything about what has happened in Dieppe. Dieppe is a medium-sized city between the uh, Namibia region where we are and, uh, and the northern France, where Winston Churchill, back in 1942, so two years prior to the D-Day landings, Winston Churchill decided to send 6,000 men Uh, Canadians, there were also hundreds of, uh, of English soldiers and a handful as well of American soldiers, but with some of them actually buried at the American cemetery uh, today in Normandy, the Normandy American Cemetery. So what happened there in Dieppe two years before is um, uh, 6,000 men was just a test. What Churchill wanted to do was to test the effectiveness of the German defenses in northern France. For that reason, he sent this uh, commando, 6,000 men, their mission was just to take the port, I mean, make a frontal assault, try to capture the port, and even if this operation succeed, was successful, even if they had to return back to England and to make their own report or their own after action report, this was just a test. As a matter of fact, this actually went uh, very badly. More, more than two thirds of, of those men had been either killed or wounded. If you ask any Canadian, he will, he will tell you about the FDIE. This is the uh, name of, of that city. One of the reasons, one of the two different reasons why so many Canadians lost their life on the app, that's first of all because when they landed, they all landed at high tide. Landed at high tide, that means the, the water was high. Most of the German obstacles that were laying on the shore could not be seen. What I mean by that is that somewhere like a, um, like a metallic cross, iron cross with some thin blades like razor blades on the top, uh, that they were actually designed to rip the bottom out of the landing barges and to make them sink. That's one of the reasons. Others were like a con very heavy concrete triangle that were designed to rest on the sea bottom. They all were equipped with a, with a mine on the top. And uh, well, I guess that explains why. Uh, and, and they were also designed to, to, to blow up the landing barges with 30, 25, between 25 and 30 men inside. That's the average of one landing barge. Uh, this is one of the two different reasons why so many Canadians The other reason is also because they tried to assault the port by a frontal assault. This is why, since it was the uh, French charge, it was the idea of Winston Churchill, 
Winston Churchill, you know that, you know how the uh, English videos can be sometimes. It was pretty much criticized. It was actually criticized all over the world for the gap failure, for the gap for disaster. But he said, remember, he first took the entire responsibility. That's what he said. This is my mistake. I will leave. Apologize. But remember that this was just a test. All <coughs> what we wanted to do was to, to make a test and to learn more about the German defenses. The price, was, the price to pay was very high. And, uh, I must say, but this is probably according to what Winston Churchill had said. This was actually, this is the tool, this is one of the reasons why uh, the landing took place later on at low tide and not high tide like they, like they did on Dieppe. Um, so this is it for the for the Dieppe failure, for the Dieppe disaster, following the Dieppe disaster. Again, Winston Churchill said, well, next time we will land at low tide, we will not repeat the same mistake. And see, it looks like uh, we have learned another lesson. The other lesson that we have learned is that we cannot obviously take any port uh, in France. It looks like the French port has been turned into, uh, into fortresses, into very it's terrible fortresses. So um, the construction of uh, different ports began under the codename Mulberry. Mulberry was just a code name for uh, the uh, uh, construction oui, of two ça. different ports. This is uh, oui. why uh, yes, and bien. how the, the different um, sports sorry, the were, sorry were built. You. They were actually built secretly in England. Um, Most Laura, of the different I pieces think, like, uh, uh, like this one I think here were your, his built, built in, uh, were, were in concrete, so very heavy. Despite their, 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 heavy, uh, their heavy weight, they were voluntary sunk in the water. Most of the time in the, in the, uh, in the river chains, they all were, it's hard to see on that picture, but they all were actually made of compartments, like watertight compartments, so that they could easily fill them with water to make them heavier and to sink them in the bottom of the channel for a while. This is uh, all about logistics, of course, but this is also very important because a port, I guess you understand that, at least one port was absolutely necessary to unload the different supplies. Uh, it was, I mean, for the operation of a lot to succeed, it was more than necessary. It was uh, vital, let's say, it was vital to, to use a port in order to bring, uh, to unload different tons of supplies necessary for the land. Now, now what we're going to do is, uh, sorry, we've got some, uh, some technical problems. What we're going to do is to have a, uh, a quick word about the, not sure it's going to be quick, we're going to have a, a few words about this particular um, map, which is one of the best map ever with, uh, and very detailed map. Why is it so detailed? Because, why is it one of the best map? Because it is very, uh, very, very well detailed with the, this is obviously from, from England. Uh, this is where the, the zone Z, this is what we call the English channel, what the English actually call the English channel. In my mind, there's nothing English in that channel, but this is not the point. In French, we call that the sleeve. It's like the, like the sleeve, uh, because it looks like the, uh, the, uh, the elbow over here, uh, and going, uh, going like this. This is what's the elbow. So this is what we uh, call the Cotentin Normandy, and this is the, what we call the Seine des Coast, right here between uh, Sord and Utah, 50 miles long, just in case you wonder how, how long, how wide was the uh, landing area. 50 miles between uh, Utah and Salt Beach. Five different beaches. Since five, there were five different beaches, there were actually five different arrows. The idea is this to make you understand who did what. Looks like the uh, green arrows are the American heroes. They first met on Zone Z. They all were supposed to gather on Zone Z on d on the night of the 5th to the 6th of June. Reminds me to tell you that the 5th of June was not the original plan. You may know that uh, the very first landing was actually not planned for, for the eve of the, of the June 6th. Everybody knows that the, the first landing was planned for June the 5th and because of the bad weather condition, the choppy waters and, and all that, it had to be postponed. This is actually what happened, but the very first landing was actually planned for May. Uh, but because of the, let's say the slowness of the US troops in Italy, they had to postpone it for a month. Then they picked uh, June the 5th and then June the 6th. So June the 6th, they first met here. Just imagine that 156,000 men all gathered in the right middle of the channel and every single force, American, Canadian and English force was to land, was to hit towards its, its uh, own objective, Utah, Omaha, Gaul, Juno and so on. I was earlier telling you that the landing was successful. The landing was successful because 
um, the, despite the numbers that Eisenhower was expecting to lose, Eisenhower was expecting to lose 40,000 men that day. In other words, he was expecting to lose um, one quarter of his men, you know, 156,000 men set foot on the French soil that day. Eisenhower, and I should say the, the chief of staff, they all were expecting to lose something like 40,000 men. I know I've been talking about war, I've been talking about human beings, but 10,000 only had been uh, killed or were casualties. Uh, it's actually much fewer from what they were expecting. Now something interesting, 10,000, since there were five different beaches, you could figure, well, there must be 2,000 on each beach. Omaha Beach, you may know this. Omaha Beach held the, more than the third of the total casualties, more than 4,000, close to, close to the half of the casualties were actually killed or wounded on Omaha Beach. This makes Omaha Beach the toughest beach, exactly the worst place to learn on the day. Close to, um, close to the half of the casualties where, where were killed on Omaha. Uh, what reason is quite obvious if you, if you just go there and, and, and go to Omaha, you just need to stand on a beach and to watch right in front of you. Looks like Omaha Beach was the only out of five beaches that was actually surrounded with cliffs and hills. You just need to imagine the Germans on top of those 30 meters high cliff waiting for you, shooting down on you. Remember that because the, of the jet failure, uh, the soldiers in the very first waves were to land Low tide, let's say mid tide, something like 400 yards away. It's like four different football pitches for those who can't deal with meters. So that's very, very wide distance. Um, so this is actually what happened on Omaha. Utah was, on the other hand, very easy, very easy. That's because this is uh, the easiest beach. This was actually the easiest, easiest beach. I'm, ter I'm sorry. Remember, 4,300 uh, around, around this number were killed or wounded. On Omaha, if you want to compare with Utah, 197 only were killed that day. That's such a big difference. So first, first of all, if you wonder why there is such a big difference, that's because on Utah, the uh, air bombing preceding the D-Day landing proved to be very accurate. It looks like more than 75% of the German bunkers had been destroyed the day before on Utah, I mean, the, the weeks before. And in addition to this, they actually did not land in the spot they were supposed to land like they all did actually on, uh, on Omaha and Utah. They actually were supposed to land in one very particular spot because again of the uh, choppy waters, because of the mistake of the uh, hot swings, because of the bad weather conditions, the choppy waters. Um, most of them landed very far away from where they were supposed to land. Uh, one of the very first men, and I swear this is true, to set foot on that beach is not an ordinary soldier. I should say he was actually an extraordinary soldier. His name was Roosevelt, for any Americans or other in the world, you, I guess you might be aware of this name. He was not actually the, the, the son of the, of the president in 1944. He was one of the, the son of one of the presidents before that time, but he was a, a nephew uh, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt Jr., who was Franklin Roosevelt, who was the president at the time of the U.S. He landed on, uh, on Utah Beach. He was actually uh, one of the very first to land on, on, on that beach. And uh, like in the movie, I guess you all watched, you all, if, if you did not watch that film, The, the Longest Day, uh, that this is one of my suggestions, you should re-watch that film. Uh, as far as I remember, Henry Fonda was playing the character. And you can see actually um, um, that gentleman living, living off his boat is what, actually one of the very first men to set foot on the French of life. And like the rest of the US or English or German officers, he was never far behind. He was, he was always, in the front, always wanted to take the lead, and is actually always represented in different photographs with his can stick, uh, and, uh, and and that's the way it is. So he really uh, shown uh, some bravery that day. Uh, he actually fearlessly crossed the uh, the different fields and was again was of the uh, one of the very first man to land on the Utah beach that day. Uh, the very sad part of the story is that I remember that he was 57 years old on June 6, 1944. For that reason, he was not supposed to land. Uh, but since he was willing, since he was really yeah, let's see, eager, willing to take part to the D-Day landings, he was finally allowed to, to participate to the D-Day landings. He did so, remember, very easy. He even sent a telegram to London, the chief of staff in London, landing on Utah, piece of cake, understand very easy. A few uh, days later, a few, one month actually later, on June 12th, he uh, died, was not killed in action, 
he just died because of a heart attack. That's the very part, sad part of the story. Another story that is uh, somehow very extraordinary is the story of this Asian guy, which is just a crazy, uh, uh, crazy uh, story. Because believe me or not, that that guy was one of the Asian. He was actually look, looks like he's very he's very young. He looks like a teen. But guess what? In 1938, he was already fighting with the Japanese, even though he's a Korean, uh, he was a Korean soldier. At that time, uh, Korea was under a Nippon flag, was fighting under a Nippon flag. And because of, it, of the problems in, um, in, uh, in Mongolia between the Russians and the Japanese, he fought the Russians and what actually, was actually captured by the Russians in 1938. Russians, the Red Army who took it in its ranks, he was then ordered to fight the Germans in 1941. He was caught, he was captured by the Germans near, uh, near uh, Dieppe, Dieppe-Petrovsk. As far as I remember, it's uh, near, the, near the actual Ukraine. Uh, taken as a, um, drafted by the uh, Germans in what you call the Ostruppen, it's like the, the troop from, from the east. He was actually sent to Normandy and he was one of the uh, Germans, one of the uh, conscripted soldiers, one of the, uh, let's say, conscripted soldiers who was forced to fight with the German, he was actually captured that day on the day. I'm not saying that he surrendered very quickly, probably, and I, I don't want to blame him actually, but he was actually captured that, that same day on Utah Beach, was interrogated and then sent back to England, where after a few weeks of uh, labor forces, was allowed to return home. That's what I consider to be uh, one of the most extraordinary stories of soldiers at war. Uh, let's carry on this way. So these are the different uh, artifacts, either uh, gift or loans from different museums or, or private, uh, private personalities. I just want to make a brief uh, stop here. Uh, let's talk about this insignia. This insignia is representing, I, I won't say, I will not say the most, uh, the most famous, but the most well-known probably um, uh, division. The big red one, first infantry division. The big red one was very well-known because the, grade, the big red one was an American division, one of the two American divisions that was intended to land on Omaha Beach the first day, along with the 29th. The, uh, unlike the 29th and 40th division, the big red one was very experienced. Most of their men were, I often say, battle hardened because they had battle hardened, they were very experienced. They served in Northern Africa and Italy, so they were really tough guys. Among them, one was the war photographer, very well known war photographer. This is the guy who took uh, 120 pictures. Among the 120 pictures he took, only, half, only 11 survived. These are the four pictures out of the 11 that survived the war uh, in 1944. His name is Kappa. Uh, I'm not talking about Frank Kappa, the movie director. I'm talking about Bob Kappa, who uh, is known for what he did along with, uh, he was a great friend of uh, Hemingway. And uh, there are still some uh, kind of history on this still very helpful uh, today. Uh, the story goes like this, he took 120 pictures and according to what he said, he back, back to England because of uh, the, the temperatures, in the, because of the highest temperatures in the dark room. Uh, it looks like the, the picture were yeah, just ruined, only uh, 11 survived. These are the four pictures of the uh, 11 pictures that survived. The, the magazine is actually the US Magazine Life, one of the most uh, popular magazines uh, at work time. Uh, now we will leave this room in order to enter the uh, second room. And this uh, large photograph is clearly uh, a tribute to the uh, city of artists, to what's left after the, the terrible battle of Normandy, the two months long battle of Normandy. Remember that the city of Caen was supposed to be seized, was supposed to be captured within a single day. It looks like Montgomery had uh, some concerns some trouble to, uh, to, to liberate the city of Town time. So this is one of the main pictures, one of the most uh, <laughs> well-known pictures. This is representing the Rue de l'Oratoire, one of the main streets downtown in the city center. Uh, what really upsets me and what really uh, is annoying me that it says, this text that says that only 30, 35% of the city was destroyed by the bombings, which is completely wrong. I guess the reason why it says 35% is that because they're considering the, the, the city nowadays. But the city at that time was not that big. I'm not saying it's a huge city, it's a medium-sized city nowadays, but at the time it was a, a very uh, tiny city. And I must say that, uh, well, 
close to 70% of the city was destroyed. This is, by the way, one of the main streets downtown in Rue de l'Oratoire. Now, 500 meters away, it's like, well, let's say 500 yards away uh, from, uh, from Rue de l'Oratoire, this famous church downtown in, Caen, in, the, in, the, in the city center looks like the uh, steeple of that church, which is, by the way, the St. Peter Church, looks like the, pit, the, the steeple of that church was hit, was voluntary hit, voluntary locked off. I cannot tell you if, it's, if it was done purposely or not, but believe me or not, at first I was thinking that the steeple was hit by, a, by an air bomb, but the uh, reality is actually different from that. The steeple of that church was actually hit by one shell like this, if Laura can just follow me. This is one of the uh, shells of the Navy HMS, the English, I should say, English battleship. HMS uh, Rodney, 4 or 6 millimeter, if you wonder what 4 or 6, like 40 centimeter diameter. Uh, the weight the, of this bomb was 9,936 uh, kilos, almost a ton, almost 1,000 kilos. The range of that, uh, of, of that shell, of, of those kind of guns was something like uh, 36 kilometer long. Uh, so just imagine the... Uh, the, 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 the bombing that day. Uh, this is one of the shells that were actually found 100 yards away from, from, the, from, the, from the church steeple in Camp. Um, this is also the, some of the robots that were found uh, in the city of Caen at the time. Now, we're gonna hit that way. And have... And talk about the... Uh, uh, Let's, let's start with this, what we call the Bocage in Normandy, the, the countryside. We are this time a little bit further west, still in the Normandy region, but let's say 20, 30 miles uh, further west in what we call the Bocage, where the Americans lost several casualties. We are no longer again in the, in the region of Caen, where the Canadians and the English fought. Uh, so further west, like 30 miles, 3 0 further west, this is where the Americans fought. Omaha and Utah, remember. This large photograph here is, uh, in my mind, one of the best tribute to help you understand the, the difficulties that the U.S. encountered during those days. The famous battle, or I should say the infamous battle of the Hedgerows. Many Americans lost their life during the battle of the Hedgerows. If you guys have ever heard something about, uh, never heard something about the, the Hedgerows, you need to imagine that most of the Hedgerows, like the, the typical Norman, uh, uh, Norman Bocage, Norman, Norman Bocage was at the time known for its very particular ground, with some uh, very narrow streets and big curves and gentle slopes that were flanked on both sides with a two meter high, uh, two meter high, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, ground. And on top of this ground were those, those trees, those trees that were so thick and so high that you actually could not see anything through the trees. So what the Germans did is very clever. Germans remember that been living here, they, uh, uh, they entered France in May, 1940. So what I mean is, when and the landing took place on June 6, 1944. The Germans had plenty of time to get used to the countryside and to, and to get ready to prepare to the, to, 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 the, uh, to, the, uh, to the landing. So what they did is obvious, is, is, uh, is easy. They just camouflaged their different tanks, their different, um, uh, how can I say, yeah. tanks, uh, mortar guns, uh, MG42. For those who never heard about the MG42, this is the, the famous automatic weapon that could speed that could fire 25 bullets a second, I'm not kidding. But this is kind of the reason why uh, so many uh, Americans lost their lives during the, the infamous battle of the Hedgerows. Now, if you guys wonder, did the German plant those trees? Because this is one of the questions that have been asked uh, uh, very often. The answer, of course, is no. Those trees have been planted here for, uh, for years, I must say decades and probably centuries ago because uh, by the farmers themselves, the idea of the farmer was to enclose their dairy cattle, their, their livestock, and to put, I would say to protect them from the wind. You know, that's just uh, the only purpose. Uh, it's hard to consider, it's unbelievable to consider that this was actually the, the main uh, concern, the main problem for the, uh, for the Americans. The uh, lucky end of that story is that the Sergeant Cullin, the US Sergeant, of course, Cullin, is the gentleman who decided a new type. He actually devised a new type of tank that was capable of uh, going through. He just uh, uh, put some kind of a metallic force in front of the tanks. So every single Sherman tank was actually able to uh, uh, run up the hill and to cut, to cut through the, the different trees. That's how the Battle of 
the edges. And, it, and one of my very last uh, tributes will go to those three men, three men who were actually Canadians. They were actually fighting in, Canada, in, a, uh, in camp, near camp. They are three men who were actually coming from different, different regiments and different region of Canada. It's actually easy and obvious to notice that they all have different uh, insignia, different helmet as well. Looks like one of them is holding the road sign Caen. Believe me or not, but those three gentlemen went through the whole war. And guess what? 40 years later, those three men again returned at the exact same spot. I'm not saying the road sign was still there, but they actually returned back to the same spot. That picture was, uh, original picture was actually taken on July the 9th, which is considered to be the date of the liberation of Caen, uh, which is actually I'm not saying this is wrong, but it's one of the two different dates. Let's say that the main part of the city, the left bank of the city of Caen was liberated by the Canadians and the, and the British. And it took 10 more days to put an end because there was a small part on the, uh, let's say, uh, on the other side of the bank. The right bank of the city of Caen had to wait. Those citizens living, living there had to wait 10 more days. So those three men returned back 40 years later and 50 years later for some big anniversary and of course, uh, we really thank to, we really want to uh, thank them, we're still thinking. I cannot tell you so far what happened to those men if they're still alive, but anyway. Um, this is almost done. Uh, this picture, I guess you can easily recognize this. This is the Arc de Triomphe in France. Why is this Arc de Triomphe in this uh, room, in this area dedicated to the Normandy region? Is that because it's quite easy to understand when the Normandy region was liberated, Paris was just liberated in a row. What I want you to understand is that as soon as Paris was liberated, as, as soon as Paris was liberated, same row. So Normandy, in other words, really paid the price for the liberation of France and for the liberation of Europe. I hope you still can hear me. Uh, I'm done with it. Excellent. I'm going to jump into one of our first okay. questions. Um, so Daniela okay. would like to know um, if you can explain the shape of the building of the main museum and um, why is it divided into yeah. two parts? She thought it looked a lot like something I, had to do. Uh, I cannot hear you clearly, actually. Uh, but, can, um, you, can you explain the shape of the building? Yeah, the shape of the building. So. Uh, we might go outside again so that I can explain the shape of the building. The building is actually representing the Atlantic Pole. I guess you all know what the Atlantic Pole was. The Atlantic Pole was, a, was a, let's say the code name given by the Germans to this uh, large and long series of German bunkers. The uh, idea of the Germans was to protect the northern part, north and western part of Europe, going, starting from Norway, going all the way down to the Pyrenees. So this building is actually representing the famous Atlantic Wall. Okay. You remember that uh, what the Atlantic Wall was? Twenty-five thousand bunkers. That's the number of uh, bunkers that Hitler was expecting uh, to build uh, before the uh, uh, before the landing. Only sixteen thousand had been built uh, when the landing started. But the main entrance here is actually the uh, how can I say is representing the breakthrough, the breakthrough, the uh, the breakthrough of the Atlantic Wall when the British and American and Canadians were. Um, broke through the Atlantic Wall. That's really interesting. Um, the next question that I have for you is where do you get a lot of the exhibition pieces from? Well, it's either from uh, loans, from uh, gifts. We also, I must tell you that uh, among all the different um, uh, work stuff that I, I've been able to talk about with you, it's just a small part of it because uh, this is actually less than. 50, less than five zero, 50 percent of our collection. We have another uh, warfare, another uh, place where we actually uh, put some different stuff and we like to change it uh, well, as often as we can. So yeah, it's a small part of it, but it comes from different loans, different gifts, either from uh, personalities or, or, or different museums. We exchange our collection. We work actually along with, uh, we've been working along with the World War II Museum in Louisiana. New Orleans, and we, uh, we, yeah, we work together so we can easily extend some of our stuff. Okay. And then do you have many first-hand accounts of survivors of the landing included in the museum as well? Yeah, but it, 
including in the museum that it, it has become very uh, very uh, unusual it's because you know that uh, they're all they're all um, they're all dying but we still have uh, inside the museum we still have either letters or or books by the way be, uh, behind me uh, behind you and uh, straight ahead uh, facing me is the, the bookshop where you have actually different books that will tell you the uh, okay and then i know you recommended one film to watch about the d-day story the longest day are there other documentaries or movies that you could recommend everything that is actually around here one of the the basic depends what kind of a history that you are if you uh one of the best book i i have ever read is actually wine wine and wars it's how the french uh the groceries and and, and different uh, french uh, Merchants uh, managed to hide thousands of bottles of wine during the during the war. So it has nothing to do with the with the actual war, but it's actually the the, the, the French daily life of uh, of personalities uh, like this who managed to to hide the bottles of wine from from the Germans. Okay, and then a question from Cadence or Cadence: The high tide landings cost a lot of lives, and by landing, were the Canadian troops dropped off planes by parachute onto the beach? Um, were, why not more sort of parachute, parachute, paratroopers dropped off inland? He was curious uh, about the strategy or equipment at the if time. You, if, you, if you don't mind repeating the question because I just heard part of it. Could you tell us a bit more about the landings and why so many people were dropped off by plane on the beach? Lauren, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, everyone, I think... Olivia, can you hear me? Yeah, but... Uh, I think our tech... Uh, I think this is a sign from the universe that we should wrap things up. I don't think our okay. tech is going to work for much longer. Probably. Um, so, Olivia, thank you very, very much for this presentation. It was really lovely. Um, to our audience, thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been a treat having you. Um, if you're interested in joining us on Awakening Week's experiences, um, you, we've, we're running the rest of France Awakening Week for the remainder of this week, and we've got a few other Awakening Weeks around the world happening. So for more information about those, you can visit tickets.com forward slash blog forward slash awakening weeks. Um, and we hope to see you at our next experiences. Uh, for now, thank you very much. Bye bye.